us one more time. And we thank you, Lord, for what we've already felt and experienced, how our souls have been touched, how our spirits, Lord, have been moved, now how our minds have been caused to entertain high and lofty thoughts about you. We bless you, Lord. Praise and magnify your name. We thank you, Lord, for the good work that you're doing in the lives of your people. We thank you, Father, for the saving grace. We thank you for your mercy and your strength. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that you bring to us. And we thank you, Father, for the love that we have in our hearts for you and for each other. We bless your holy name. For you're worthy to be praised. And Father, we thank you for these young people who have a heart and a mind to serve God. And we thank you for those who provide them with leadership and with direction and who sacrificially, Lord, aid them along in their walk with you. And we pray that you might bless them and multiply their efforts, Lord, and that it might bring glory to your name. And Father, we pray for those who've come this morning weary and tired and distraught and mixed up and confused, but believing that maybe there's a word from God, that maybe God will speak and maybe God will bring some order to the confusion and chaos in their life. And Maybe God will show up and break the yoke of bondage that grips their souls. Maybe God will touch a mother or father, sister, brother, or child. Maybe God will mend a broken, frayed, and frazzled relationship. And maybe God will open the door of opportunity so that physical and material needs can be met. But Father, we know that a hope is an anchor for our soul. It's sure and it is steadfast and that we're never disappointed when we put our hope, our trust, and our faith in you. And now, Father, we pray that you would speak to us one more time. Open the old book to us one more time. Break to us the word of life one more time. Feed us until we want no more one more time. Quench the thirst of our tired, weary souls one more time. May the Holy Spirit be a well of living water springing up inside of us just one more time. May our tired, weary souls be revived to run on just one more time. May we leave this place convinced and persuaded that God still rules and reigns, and he's still active. He's still involved in the affairs of his people. Now speak to us, Lord. Your servants have ears to hear what thus saith the Lord in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Remain standing, please, and, and turn with me in the, the gospel of St. Luke. The gospel of our Lord and Savior is recorded by the New Testament writer, St. Luke, that beloved physician. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and I would like to read verses 22 through 25. Familiar text. Luke 8, verses 22 through 25. I'm reading again this morning from the New American Standard translation of the Holy Book. Luke 8, verses 22 through 25. Now on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat. And he said to them, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep, and a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. And they came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And when he had said to them, Poor is your faith. They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, and the King James reads, What manner of man is this? Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water? And they obey him. May the Lord's rich blessing be upon his word. May it be sanctified in our hearts. You may be seated. I want to speak this morning uh, from the subject of the stormy voyage to the other side. The stormy voyage to the other side. I can recall when I was a kid, I had this.
fascination with machines and automobiles and motorcycles in particular. Many of you, like myself, you grew up in homes and families that did not have access to an automobile. So your major mode of transportation was, was by foot. And every now and then, I think about having to walk everywhere that I went. As a matter of fact, the spirit of my youth rose up inside of me just the other day. I had to drop my wife's car for some repairs. And I'm somewhat impatient, and they were saying the courtesy van won't be back for another hour, and I was looking at my clock, and I said, well, I was in South Charleston at the Joe Holland Chevrolet place, so I said, well, I can walk to the church in 30 minutes. So I broke out the walking. <laughs> 45 minutes later, with perspiration beating off my brow, the sun beating down on me, I'm at the Patrick Street Bridge. A lot longer than what I thought. It's a lot farther distance when you're picking them up and laying them down than when you're in an automobile. But I made it. I made it to the church, and the ladies got a big kick out of me walking from South Charleston. But it reminded me of my, my youth when we had to walk everywhere. My grandmother, she was a walker, a little old short lady. She wasn't five feet tall, but she'd break out in a minute walking, and we'd walk for miles. Uh, she believed in, in walking. And as a matter of fact, she never had a driver's license, and you couldn't hardly get her to seat, sit in the front seat of an automobile. And so she believed in walking. But I was converted quickly to riding, because I realized you could get places quicker. And I remember there was a young man in our community. His name was Warney what we called him, and when he turned 17, he bought this motorcycle. And everyone was fascinated with this motorcycle. It's, it's kind of exciting to watch someone zip through on a motorcycle. It appears to be exhilarating, exciting, and so I was walking one day, and Warney stopped, and he said, you want to ride? And I said, sure. So I jumped on the back of Warney's motorcycle. I think it was a Kawasaki 250 or something, and he started zipping through the community. And where I'm from, it's kind of a curvy road back, and he was zipping back up through there. And Warney wasn't a very good driver, as a matter of fact. And he drove way too fast for my sensibilities. And so I'm scared to death on the back of this motorcycle. And I'm praying to myself, Lord, I will never get on the back of a motorcycle again if you let this thing come to a stop and I can get off it safely. And I can say to this day, I don't think I've ever been on the back of a motorcycle. He scared me to death. And we only went about two miles. It was a lot different being on the back of the motorcycle than it was watching him zip through town. It looked like a lot of fun watching him do those crazy things, leaning the curves and so forth. But when you're on the back of it and your destiny is in someone else's hands, it's not nearly as much fun. As a matter of fact, it's terrifying. You've got to be careful about who you get on the back of a motorcycle behind, Sister Stanton. You've got to be careful about who you commit your destiny to when they say, get in and let's go for a ride. Such was the case in this text in Mark chapter 8, or Luke chapter 8. Jesus has been ministering in and around the sea or the lake of Galilee. And the Bible says that after he had concluded the ministry there, and after some days of exhausting ministry, he said to his disciples, get in the boat and let us go over to the other side. Now, they felt this would be a very uneventful trip. The Lake of Galilee is just a couple of miles wide. It's not very large at all. It's, a not, it's not a very foreboding body of water. And so they get in the boat as Jesus has instructed, and they start the journey to the other side. But the Lake of Galilee is strategically located between two mountains. And its weather patterns within those mountains are very, very unpredictable. As a matter of fact, the sun can be shining, the skies can be crystal clear. But just in a matter of moments, a storm can brew. And when the storm comes down through the ravine there, the Lake of Galilee, the mountains on either side serve as a wind tunnel. The winds get trapped inside of the mountain. They start ricocheting back and forth off of the sides of the mountain. And as the wind pushes its way down the Lake of Galilee, down 
the, in the middle of the lake, it increases in velocity. As the wind increases in velocity back and forth off the mountains, it then starts to crash down upon the water. And as it crashes down upon the water, it creates white water and waves. And the water can go from being crystal clear to being turbulent in a matter of minutes. Is that not the way life is? We sail along, happy-go-lucky. We sail along, footloose and fancy-free. We sail along, not giving much attention to our environment. And all of a sudden, Suddenly and without warning, something happens in our lives to arrest our attention to the fact that life is serious business. And it is no respecter of persons. And the sun shines on the just and on the unjust, and the rain comes on the just and on the unjust, and the storms of adversity and difficulty and hardship is no respecter of persons. And if we live long enough, and if God allows our golden moments to roll on long enough, the storms and the winds of difficulty, of tribulation and tests will wrap even on our doors. On our doors. And so the Bible says that the disciples of Jesus got in the boat and they launched out to go to the other side. You know, the Christian life is it's a journey. When we came to faith in Jesus Christ, we, we put our trust in him. And just as I didn't have any more sense than to put my trust in warning than to get on the back of that motorcycle, I gave careful thought before I put my trust in Jesus. Because it was my eternal destiny that was at stake. It was where my soul would spend all of eternity. And so when, my, when I hitched my wagon to his star, when I got on the back of Jesus Kawasaki, I mean, that's what was saying, Lord, I'm going to commit myself to you. And I'm going to trust that you can get me through the uneven topography, the difficult terrain, that you can navigate your way around the potholes and the pitfalls of life. And Lord, you can get me all the way to glory. That's a long way. You know, glory is a lot farther distance from downtown Mount Hope to the stadium terrace where I live. That was only about two miles. But glory is a long way. And it's a difficult road. It's a hard press. And there are storms of adversity and there are winds of oppression and tribulation that will beat upon our lives. But we must remember that we have entrusted ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says they trust him and they get in the boat. Now they were experienced fishermen, particularly Peter, James, and John. They fished the Lake of Galilee, so they were familiar with the unpredictable weather patterns along this little body of water. And so the Bible says, as they were sailing along, that he fell asleep. That's just like Jesus. It's just like Jesus to do the unpredictable. The Bible says that he falls asleep and they are sailing along. And there are times that in my life that it appears to me that Jesus is asleep. I don't know about you. But there are, there are times when he appears to be asleep because I, I don't hear him clearly. I don't sense his presence with the profundity that I would like to sense his presence. And so every now and then I say, Lord, are you awake up there? You remember the story about the gentleman who fell off the cliff that late night, he was walking down the, the railroad tracks and he cut off of the tracks to take a shortcut down the path. Shortcuts get you in trouble, but he, he's going to take a shortcut on a dark night when he didn't know where he was going. And so he walks and he comes to the end of a ledge and he falls off the ledge, but he's able to grab hold to a small tree and to catch himself. And all night long he was agonizing, How, what am I going to do? I'm going to fall to my death, and the mere thought of falling, it, it, it causes the heart to become anxious. I don't know about you, but I still uh, have nightmares of somebody's after me and I'm running. And I always run to the same cliff in my hometown and always jump off, and my heart starts to beat real fast, and just before I hit the ground, my, I wake up. And as a matter of fact, on one particular day, my wife almost made me have a heart attack. And just as I jumped off the cliff and was about to fall, she touched me. <laughs> And my heart was already racing at about a thousand beats per minute, and she touched me right there on my heart. It almost jumped out of my chest. But he fell off the cliff, and he's holding on out of that tree. 
And he remembers his grandmother that his grandmother used to pray for him. <laughs> and he starts to pray. And he starts to call on the Lord. And he says, oh, Lord God, I yump the Lord, I yump the do you hear my cry? And the voice from heaven cried, I hear you, son. I hear you cry. He said, Lord, can you help me? Can you deliver me just this time, Lord? If you deliver me, I will serve you faithfully for the rest of my life. And the voice responded, I hear you, son. I hear you, son. He said, help me, Lord. And the voice said, just let go, son. Just let go. And he cried out, is there anybody else up there that can help me? <laughs> Sometimes the answer that God gives to us is not the answer we want to hear. Sometimes when God tells us to trust him and to lean not to our own understanding, he's going to see us through and he's going to navigate our way into the footsteps of a good man or a good woman are ordered of the Lord, but we don't want to let go and trust it. And so he agonized the whole night long until the sun broke and cracked the eastern skies. And then he looked down and he was six inches off the ground. <laughs> a mere six inches off the ground. But he'd agonized all night long. Some of us are agonizing over situations and circumstances. We're travailing and we're getting ourselves all worked up and we wonder how is it going to work out and what's my husband going to do, what my wife's going to do, what are the children going to do, how are they going to turn out. And God is saying, lean not to your own understanding. All your ways acknowledge me, trust me, let go and allow me to guide and direct your life and give me the reins of your life. But we're holding on all night long agonizing until our fingernails are white and our knuckles become white, our hands are calloused and we are holding on and what we're holding on to cannot sustain us anyway. In the end, we have to trust him. When we come to the end of it all, we have to trust him. We have to believe that God is able to keep that which we commit to him against that day. We have to trust him. We have to remember the words of Jude, and he says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. When it's all said and done, my beloved friends, you got to trust him. You got to get on the back of the Kawasaki. You got to wrap your arms around his waist and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. As we're going around the curves up Route 60 or Route 61, as you're leaning in the deep water mountain, when it appears that we're going to topple over the other side, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And even when heaven appears to be mute and silent, and even when it appears that you cannot get a prayer through, you've got to trust him. And you've got to believe that if you just hold on for a little while longer, that God will answer your humble cry. And so the Bible says, but Jesus was asleep. And while he was asleep, a fierce gale of wind descended upon the lake. And they began to be swamped and to be in danger. The fierce winds, when they come down on the lake, the environment on which we're in, and the waters are beating up against the sides of our lives, our homes, our families, and our children. And we're trying to stay up late at night praying, and we're trying to bail the water out. But as fast as we can bail it out, it seems to be pouring over inside of us. You know, I had such an experience. About four years ago, I looked at the roof of my house, and it was pretty, pretty tattered and torn. But the budget wasn't acting quite right. And I said, well, it was uh, early spring. No, it was late fall. I said, I think I can make it to the spring. Surely I can get about, about four or five more months out of this roof. But you know how it is. It falls hard on roofs, and the winter is even harder. And then when the spring comes and all the rain starts to come, and the roof has been frozen parts of it, and it's come drilling hard when it's been, been already worn and dried out and starts to crack. And, and one night there were torrential downpours in our city. And I heard a trickle of water. And I'm a light sleeper. I heard the water. And I was upstairs, the water, a leak had sprung downstairs, and the water was leaking. It was hitting on the kitchen table. So I got up, and I ran downstairs, and I got a pot, and I put a pot on the table. And I heard another. Over in the family room, I got another pot, and I put it over there. 
And then all of a sudden, it almost sounded like it was a, an orchestrated chorus. And there were trickles everywhere, and I had pots and pans and cups, and I got up in the ceiling there, up in the attic, and I had stuff up there trying to stop the water from coming. It was coming in from everywhere. I'd sprung about 25 leaks in one night. And finally, I decided, I'm going to bed. <laughs> I'm just going to go to bed. There's nowhere in the world that I can stop all of these leaks from coming in. It was coming in faster than I could put buckets and pots and pans to try to catch it. That's the way it is sometime in life. The stuff is coming at you from every direction, from every which way, as my grandmother used to say. You don't know which way to turn, but you got to trust it. And so the Bible says that the wind gales were beating against the boat. They ran to Jesus. <laughs> Verse 24, they came to Jesus and, and they woke him up. And they say, Lord, don't you care? Lord, are you not concerned? Lord, does it not bother you that we are about to perish, they said to Jesus. And they had forgotten the lessons that he had taught to them. And they had forgotten the lesson he had taught to them when he saw the lily growing up there in the field. He said, look at the lily of the field. And compare it to Solomon, Solomon who had his royal regalia as the king, Solomon who dressed and would present himself to the people and the people would marvel at Solomon's wardrobe. And Jesus said, but God is so concerned about the lilies of the field that the lilies of the field are arrayed in more splendor and glory than Solomon even in his very heyday. And the lily of the field is only for a little while, and, and then it's gone. How much more will God be concerned about his children? Amen. The children that caused him to get up off the precipice of his reign, step down off his royal diadem, walk through 42 generations, wrap himself up in human flesh, and go to the cross of Calvary, and hang there, and die as a sin offering for the world. How much more will God care about us? Amen. They've forgotten what Jesus told them. They'd forgotten the lesson he told them about the sparrow out in the field. And the sparrow going from tree to tree, he says, look at the sparrow. The sparrow does not plant. The sparrow is not preoccupied with planting a crop. He's not preoccupied with having a worm farm to grow something to eat. But the sparrow believes that when he gets up that he's going to find food. Jesus says, if God provides for the sparrows of the air, how much more will he not provide for his own children. Amen. And so for them to ask this, this question, for them to, to ask the question of Jesus, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that we are about to perish? To, to ask that question meant that they had, had suffered from spiritual amnesia. And there are some of you who are suffering from spiritual amnesia. Every time the trouble come your way, every time the things don't go the way you want them to go, you think that all is lost. You're suffering from spiritual amnesia. You've got to call to remembrance what God has brought you through already. You have called to remember how he's brought you through many toils and dangers and snares. You have to call to remember how God has salvaged your life when you're at the point of destruction. You've got to remind yourself of what great things God has already done for you to build up your spiritual confidence. And so they were suffering from spiritual amnesia and they had forgotten all that Jesus had taught them and all he had done for them. And so they said, Lord, don't you care that we are about to perish? And the Bible says that he got up. And that warms my heart to know that the sovereign king, that the powerful potentate, that the ruler of the universe will get up to the cry of his children. Are you following me? You know, I'm a father of five, and as I shared with you earlier, I'm a light sleeper, and I can distinguish my children's voice in a crowd of other children, and my children can recognize their ears have been sensitized and fine-tuned to my whistle, so I can whistle in a crowd, and if they're there, all their heads will turn because we're on the same wavelength. And so when I hear one of them cry or whimper in the night, I hear their footsteps when they get out of their bed to go to the restroom. I can hear them they're making them way downstairs to get water, and I will rise up to make sure that everything is all right. I will get up 
And any good father who's worth his salt will get up to tend to his children when they need his assistance. Now, we as earthly fathers, if we get up in response to our children's cries and pleas, how much more will a holy God get up? He will get up. Come here, Stephen, and testify. You remember the story of Stephen, don't you? The first martyr of the early church in Acts 7, and Stephen is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the religious erudites of the day, they could not withstand his righteousness and the power of his message, but they didn't want his Jesus. And the Bible says that they took up great stones and they stoned him to death. But before his exodus from time to glory, the Bible says that he looked up toward heaven and that Jesus was standing. He was standing up, attending to the situation ready to dispatch angels down to lift his soul that he might be with him in paradise. When Jesus' children cry, he gets up. Amen. And so the Bible says he gets up. And he rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped and became calm. When Jesus speaks, even the elements have to listen. When Jesus speaks, the weather patterns have to obey. When Jesus speaks, the Bible says that the wind stopped. It didn't dissipate. It just stopped dead in its tracks and ceased to blow. And the waves of the sea laid down like a whoop puppy dog and was at peace and rest in response to the word of the sovereign king. I just stopped by to tell you, when you hook your wagon to Jesus' hitch, and when Jesus tells you he's going to take you over to the other side, when you get in the boat with Jesus, he didn't say we're going to go out to go under. He didn't say we were going to go out to see how well y'all can tread water. He didn't go out to, say, to see if y'all can survive the life-saving cast. He says we're going over to the other side. And what he did not do, he did not give them the details of the voyage. You see, Jesus is not like AAA, and he's not like all-state travel plan. He does not give you a pre-planned map of your trip. He doesn't tell you all the places you're going to go, all the detours you have to take, all the storms that you have to encounter. But what he does tell you, I am with you even to the end, and we are going out, and we are going over to the other side. And if necessary, I will cause the winds and the waves to stop. If necessary, I will part waters. If necessary, I will call down the walls of Jericho. If necessary, I will do whatever it takes by any means necessary to ensure that you make it over to the other side. And he said to them, where is your faith? It only takes a little bit of faith to serve God. It doesn't take a whole lot. It only takes a little bit of faith to serve God. It takes less faith to serve God than it takes to open a can of Campbell's soup and eat it. And you do that every day. Have no idea where it came from. Have no idea about the formulation process. You are trusting that the United States government, the Department of Agriculture, has enough laws and rules and regulations in place to ensure that when that Campbell's soup get to your home, it's not going to kill you when you eat it. You got more faith than what you think. You, got, you believe in a system that you know that has corruption in it. You believe in people that you know that are frail and flawed. And you believe in a process where you know you got at least one or two idiots running loose that you, we can't get control of. But we, we, we're trusting it anyhow. It takes more faith to eat a can of Campbell's soup than it takes to trust God because the universe is a testimony to the power of God, Amen. his ability to sustain the universe and to keep the earth in its orbits. The things that we see are testimony to the proof and the existence of a sovereign ruler who is the architect of it all and who sustains it all. And our mere existence, the fact that we wake up in the morning, is not a minor miracle, it's a major miracle that we're not all comatose. That God calls the body processes to keep functioning. You know, I, I suffer from this, this, this sleep thing they call where you, you snore so loud you wake everybody up. I, I can talk about myself and make fun of myself. I always kidding my wife that I, I don't snore. Until I woke myself up. So, <laughs> so my, my wife, God bless her heart, 
She bought me some of these uh, Breathe Rights, whatever you got. I think it kind of worked a little bit, really. And, and so I tried one. Only problem was I kind of scared myself. I put it on at night, and I forgot I put it on. And so the next morning, well, early in, in, in the morning, I woke up, and so I went to the restroom. I looked in the mirror, you know, and it kind of scared me. I said, who is that guy in that mirror? Who would have broken my house here? But, but every now and then, I snore so loud, I, I wake my, myself up. And I'm tossing and I'm, I'm turning and this type of business, but the little thing didn't help, so I'm going to try it for a while. But it's good to know that God is a God who doesn't slumber. Amen. And God is a God who does not require sleep. And God is a God who's on the job 24 hours a day, ready to respond to the cries of his children. But he said to him, where is your faith? It only takes a little bit of faith to serve me and to trust me and allow me to prove myself to you, the type of God that I am, and I will come through for you when you need for me to come through. And the Bible says that they looked at each other and they said, what kind of man is this? This is a strange cat here. What kind of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. And that was a demonstration of God's power that he might strengthen the faith of his disciples that they might know regardless of what circumstance or situation you find yourself in. If you call on me, I will get up. And when I get up, I will show up. And when I show up, I have the power to do something about the situation. I can do something about it. And that's the God that we serve. If you read that text a little bit further, what you'll find in the remaining verses there in, Acts, in Luke chapter 8, that Jesus risked life and limb of his disciples to get over to the other side, and what was waiting for them on the other side was a man possessed with a demon. There was a work to be done on the other side. There was a mission to be accomplished on the other side. There's someone who needed ministry on the other side. What are you saying to me, preacher? What I'm saying is that God is taking you through things, and you're out in the mix midst of the tempestuous turbulent seas and you're tossed and you're driven like a cork in the midst of the water but God is preparing you because there's ministry and service on the other side but when you show up on the other side you need some big faith some strong faith to believe in God because before you start dealing with demons and devils you better believe that God is a God who has power and so God had to bring them to the brink of their own death where they were looking death in the eyes that he might show what type of God he was so that their faith would be strong enough so they'd be prepared to take on devils and demons when they got to the other side. And God is equipping you for something. He's a strengthening you for something. He has you and I in his spiritual gymnasium. We're going through calisthenics and aerobics and stretching exercises and God is disciplining our inner person that we might be strong enough to stand in an evil day when we have to stand up and fight demons and devils. We got to stand up to the spiritual darkness and wickedness in high places that are trying to destroy and to pervert our children. We might be able to stand up to the enemy in that evil day as he's trying to destroy families and break up husbands and wives it takes spiritual muscle and strength to do that and so we got to go through something Amen. so that we can stand up yes, when God stands up yes. and calls his army to mount up and go to battle for him amen, amen. amen. oh trouble is real yes, yes. but it don't last always <laughs> Aunt Louise <laughs> it don't last always Trouble don't last always. It, it has an end to it. It, it. it runs its course. And this too shall pass. The psalmist said weeping endures for the night, but joy comes in the morning because trouble just can't last always. Because in the end, darkness has to give way to the sunlight. I don't know how dark the night, but when the sun cracks the sky, darkness has to flee. Darkness is like trouble in your life. It can't last always. When the Son of God rises up in your life, then trouble has to dissipate. Amen? So you just keep trusting him. And don't, don't jump out the boat now when Jesus is in there with you. You see, the, the most unwise thing that they could have done would have been to jump out the boat. It's always safer where Jesus is, regardless of how bad the storm might be. The worst place to be is where Jesus isn't. 
So if Jesus said, get in the boat, you stay right there in the boat and grab hold to something, just hold on until the storm passes over. Or you be encouraged and you keep serving him, you stay faithful to him, and you keep calling on his name, and you keep witnessing for him and telling someone else about him. And even when you are hungry, you keep telling folk that Jesus Christ is the bread of life. And when you are confused and perplexed and you don't know which way you're going to turn, you keep testifying and say, but he's a wonderful of a counselor. Yeah. And when you, when you feel lonely and, and isolated and rejected and all by yourself, you keep telling what a friend we have in Jesus. Keep testifying to the truth of the word of God. And after a while, he's going to stand up. He's going to stand up and show himself to be a mighty God in your life. If you're here this morning, and you're going through trouble, you're going through difficulty, and you, it feels like that you're right in the eye of the hurricane, and you don't know which way to go or which way to turn. I just want to encourage you to turn your face towards the Lord and trust Him. Lean on Him. Let Him prove Himself to be the type of God that He said that He is, who will never leave nor forsake. Let him prove himself to be the mighty God, the wonderful of a counselor, the prince of peace. Let God prove himself to you in your life. He'll do that. Amen. If you've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never come to that point in your life to where you look at the man or woman in the mirror and concluded that there's something wrong with you, you you've sinned, you've, you've broke the law of God, and you do feel guilty, because you are guilty and you don't have peace and you don't have the sense of God's presence if you come to that point in your life and you desire and long to be right with God just to know that things are right between you and God I invite you to trust him just trust his word there's some things we can't figure out but we trust him just trust his word, trust him, trust him that he will save you, that he will forgive you, that he will give you peace. Just trust him and call on him and say, Lord, save me. Forgive my sins, come into my life. Just trust him right there with, with that simple prayer. Lord, save me, come into my life. If you pray that prayer from a heart of sincerity, God will show up. He will meet you right where you are. He will start you on an exciting journey, an exciting voyage that will culminate on the celestial shores of glory. Just trust him. Just trust him. If you hear this morning, you've backslid. If you haven't been living for the Lord the way you know he desires for you to, just trust him. Trust his word that says he's married to a backslider, that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Just trust him. Take him at his word. If you're looking for a church home, and you sense that it's time for you to settle down and be accountable with a group of people that can encourage you in your walk with God, and that you can carry you in their walk with God, and you can grow together. Trust that maybe God has sent you here, and this is the place that he would allow, would have you to drop your spiritual anchor. Just trust him. If you need to be saved, why don't you come? If you're backslidden, why don't you come? If you're looking for a church home, why don't you come? And just trust him and see if he will not be all that he's promised to be. The doors of the church are open. The invitation is extended. Whosoever will, let him come. Let her come. Drink of the water of life freely. Just trust him. We've all had to come this way who know the Lord. No one's going to laugh and make fun of you. We've all had to come this way. But we've had to come to grips with the fact that we were the real problem. And our own sin caused us the most pain. And only the Lord could take that away and forgive us. While the musician plays, while the Spirit of the Lord speaks to your heart, I'm going to ask you to trust it. To trust it.